The first story is taken from Broken Inside Me. Is it my fault that I kicked out my brother, whom our parents had already disowned, because he told my now ex-fiancé that I cheated on him nine years ago? My brother Alexander is 19, my sister Zoe is 26, and my now ex-fiancé Daniel is 28. Also, as noted in the headline, my brother was kicked out when he was 16 because our parents snooped through his phone and discovered he was gay. Alexander had his birthday last weekend, so he gathered his buddies, all of them were between the ages of 18 and 22. I'm drinking and playing video games. When Alexander asked if Daniel and I wanted to join them, we were about to leave to let them have the property to themselves. I originally declined, thinking I was too old to be drinking games, but he insisted, and Daniel felt it would be great to pretend to be college students again. We were all very tipsy when Alexander suggested playing Never Have I Ever. Several rounds into the statement, the phrase I've never cheated before came up. Now is a good moment to note that Daniel is adamantly opposed to cheating. His ex-fiancé cheated on him, which emotionally destroyed him. And, unfortunately, I cheated on my five-month-old boyfriend, as many foolish 17-year-olds do. It was a stupid mistake he discovered and rightfully ended things. This was nearly a decade ago. I obviously learned my lesson and look back with shame. I obviously never cheated since. Well, my brother knows about this, so when I didn't drink, he went, Hey sis, what the hell? You are aware that you cheated, insert your ex's name. You must consume it. Paz looked at me, then at him, and then went out of the room. I followed him and tried to talk to him, telling him it was a foolish youthful mistake, but he had none of it and abruptly ended things. I'm feeling numb. I'm devastated. He meant everything to me, and my future plans remain uncertain. Alexander apologized, but all I feel is grief and emptiness. I served him with an eviction notice this morning. He pleaded with me to stay, saying he didn't mean to harm my relationship and that he simply didn't think when he spoke those words. I simply cannot look at him right now. He wrecked my life after I reared and cared for him as if he were my own. I'm devastated. Is it possible that I'm being unreasonable? You know, there's a lot to unpack in just one narrative. The brother is clearly the moron. He mentioned it. You're inebriated, and he brought this up, and it was a mistake on his part to do so. It's heinous behavior, yet it happened, and it was a mistake. Because this happened 10 years ago, your fiancé is clearly a moron. People do make errors. Yes, cheating is a major issue, but it's still young. Essentially, you've learned your lesson in life. You've moved on, and hopefully you're a much better person than what it sounds like. And you're the asshole because you know your brother made a mistake, too. I'm sure he didn't go out of his way to ruin your relationship. And it was just a drunken thing said, so I think everyone stinks here. But this guy puts it way better than I just put it, and Rogers says I'm going to have to say everyone stinks here. It is puzzling why he believed it was a good idea to inform everyone, hey everyone, my sister is a cheater. But I understand that because he was inebriated. Alcohol causes you to do stupid things. I can readily see how inebriation's lack of judgment could have led him to believe it was an acceptable thing to do. Why is your fiancé an idiot? Probably the most contentious, but I believe your ex-fiancé stinks the most. I understand the anguish of being hurt in the past as a result of cheating. But he's holding a mistake you made as a teenager against you. Assuming you're being truthful, you never cheated on him, you never indicated that you did, and the relationship was otherwise fulfilling. Breaking off a relationship over something you did a decade ago is excessive. Why are you an idiot? Your rage is being misdirected. I understand your disappointment because your fiancé abandoned you, but I believe that is more of a fiancé issue than a brother one. According to your narrative, he wasn't malicious, 
and he's clearly sorry. No great relationship should end so abruptly and without warning, especially when it happened a decade ago. I wouldn't allow this blimp to spoil a fine relationship you have with your brother. Please forgive him. Hey, I appreciate your thorough analysis of the matter, says Patterson in response. I know you're correct. He had no intention of hurting me. He just doesn't think all the time. I adore my younger brother. I'd like to forgive him. But when I look at him, all I feel is grief and fury. Today, I'm going to make my first therapist appointment. Thank you for your decision. And Evan points out that if your fiancé stopped things so swiftly because you cheated on an ex almost a decade ago and never did it again, he was probably already wanting to end it. Or you could be on the fence. That is not typical. Marshall says you're the idiot brother. Did you a huge favor? The cheating was a decade ago and wasn't on him. The fact that he got mad over something that happened to him is a huge red flag. Frankly, I think your ex is the biggest idiot of the three of you, and you're lucky it ended now instead of later. I know you're hurt, but you'd have been hurt a lot worse if this relationship had continued and wiggled. But, as Biscuit points out, everyone stinks. You're a jerk for evicting your brother, who has no other family. Your partner stinks for dumping you over something you did nine years ago because of a silly mistake during a drinking game. Your brother was the least bad. He was acting like a jerk. But he hasn't accused you of cheating on your current relationship. He had no reason to believe it would blow out in your life in this way. Terry Brunt has written our next article. Is it my fault that I won't let my grandmother near my baby? Because she lied about it when I was 15 years old. I'm 28 years old, married to Sarah, and have three children, four-year-old twin boys and a three-month-old girl. My grandmother is 71 years old and female. My mother had twins, a boy and a girl, when I was 15 years old. Because of the C-section, she was placed on bed rest. She'd gone hard, and she'd lost a lot of blood. When she needed help while I was in school full-time, she allowed my grandmother into our home for free to assist her. My mother would threaten to force her out at some point because she would check on the twins every morning to find my brother. My grandmother, who was extremely overweight, had taken my brother from his cot and was sleeping on the couch with him on her bosom. My mother repeatedly ordered her to stop, but she persisted, so she threatened to kick her out. My grandma retaliated by telling my mother, who was suffering from severe postpartum depression, that my two-month-old sister had rolled off the bed and fallen onto the tile floors. This never occurred. This clearly caused enormous concern on my mother's end, causing her to spiral because she was already suffering from postpartum depression. As a result, I don't want my grandmother near my infant. Because I was out of state when my twins were born, she didn't see them until they were two years old, and she was never permitted to be alone with them. However, now that I am in the United States and have a child, she has been pleading with me to let her meet my daughter. I kept telling her no but gave no reason until last night when I reminded her of how she had caused my mother unnecessary anxiety. I would not allow her near my child because I would not risk her doing the same to me. My grandmother lost it and tried to convince us that the incident never occurred and that we made it up to make her seem terrible. She told everyone that a lot of her family had sided with her and that she needed to let go and stop living in the past. I've been warned that I'm alienating my grandmother and will destroy her by not allowing her to bond with my child. And I believe we are witnessing a classic case of gaslighting right here with the, with the, with the sentence. My grandmother lost it and tried to claim that the incident never occurred and that we made it up to make her look terrible. Do you remember what happened? Everyone knows what happened, and if you feel that passionately, you have no obligation to allow her to see your child. That is entirely your decision. So, in my perspective, he is not stupid. However, the imbecile claims that the attempt was not successful. 
That is a serious breach of trust. And the inability to let go of the past. Isn't this an indication that you need to mature? It's proof of how horribly your grandmother screwed up. You're still dealing with this after 13 years. My wife and I have a large toxic family on both sides and totally support each other and anyone who chooses to avoid contact. Contrary to popular belief, you may pick your family. You are under no obligation to allow her to meet your children, according to Andrew. In fact, allowing her into your lives, no matter how temporary, is a disservice to your children. Keep your cool and protect your children. And Zachary claims that her refusal to confess that she did this to her kid shows she is unwilling to accept responsibility for her actions. She is still attempting to manipulate people, which is inappropriate behavior. Not the moron. Kelly responds, but you should ask her. Are you imagining things or living in the past? Tell her to pick one and stop talking about it. That turmoil does not belong in your life. Gray claims that she is deceiving you. Don't fall for it, regardless of what grandma says, your primary priority is your children. In this case, what would you do? What if you had someone like that putting pressure on you to let them see your children? How would you handle it? Our next story is from day seven. Am I an idiot for calling the cops when my roommate stole my cat? I'm Zoe, and I lost my only adoptive parent last year. His brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, and cousins didn't want anything to do with me. They never saw me as family, and after my father died, they cut me out completely, taking everything that belonged to my father, but I was able to keep some things to remember him with. It's hard not having him here, especially during the holidays. I don't have any family, grandparents, or friends to wish me a Merry Christmas or surprise me with a gift. Chol, my cat, is all I have. He's really cute, and he always cheers me up when I'm down or weeping. I currently share a residence with my roommate. We split the rent 50 to 50. I should point out that Chol and I arrived before her. She was aware of Chol and didn't mind moving in a month ago, but she began whining about him and making him feel uneasy with her treatment. She had ordered me to find him a home rather than keep him at the flat, and I had tried to locate him a new owner several times before I begged her to stop. Chol does not belong to her. She put a picture of him on Facebook and said she was looking for a new owner. That was revealed to me the day before Christmas. She exited the apartment with Chol. I wasn't there when it happened, and I freaked out, phoning her number and telling her she had to come back with Chol or I'd call the cops. Her sister intervened and informed me that what she did was terrible, but that calling the cops was too much. I shouted at them both and told them to return Chol the next day. I had to call the cops on her. I reclaimed Chol, and my roommate got into a fight with the landlord because the cops were involved. She, her sister, and a few common acquaintances are calling me names and accusing me of being a jerk for going to the police and generating this massive problem. She had completely forgotten that she had tried to surrender Chol to a new owner and had refused to allow me to spend the holidays with him. They claim I overreacted and handled the situation improperly. We've seen stories previously about individuals attempting to steal pets and give them away, and it still boggles my mind that someone could simply grab someone's pet and say, right, you're going to a new owner. See ya. Who does that kind of bizarre nonsense, man? It's insane. And there's no way you're the fool for calling the cops. If someone stole one of my pets, I don't have any right now, but maybe one day. But if someone stole my imaginary pet and tried to deliver it to a new owner, I would definitely contact the cops and, you know, kick them out immediately, try to get them kicked out, or move away from them. Some people are insane, and if they can do it once, they will certainly do it again. We've seen it before on the subreddit and many other subreddits, people doing weird stuff, so get out of there or kick that person out one way or another. 
but small Charizard says he is not an idiot. She kidnapped your pet. What type of individual would do that? Patterson responds, claiming that my roommate is a jerk. She's clearly a troublemaker, and this isn't the first time she's done anything like this. I've barely known her for a month, and she's already been really unpleasant and inconsiderate. Hannah's Flora stated that you or your roommate must go immediately. Given what she did and her reaction, she will undoubtedly attempt this again. Meanwhile, if Chol isn't microchipped, he should be. I don't often recommend this, but Chol should remain in your room with a lock on the door that only you can open until you're no longer living with this person. Short-term unfair treatment of the cat is worthwhile until you are confident that you can keep him safe and with you. Because your roommate will try again and again and again until she succeeds or one of you moves out. And she stole so many whips, it says. Who is the sister expecting you to contact? The Ghostbusters are back. Not the moron. I'm glad you were able to reclaim him. Not the fool, according to Sugar321. You could also look into ways to get rid of the roommate. I'm sure if she did that, God alone knows what else she'd do. Maybe poison him or something wrong up. In this case, what do you believe Patterson should do? I'm presuming they're rented, so can they get them evicted with a landlord? Or do you believe they should just leave and get out while they can? Please let us know in the comments section below. Our next story comes from the University of Texas. And I'm the idiot for allowing my daughter to celebrate Christmas against the disapproval of my husband and his family. My brother-in-law died in an auto accident on Christmas Day, 2018, at the age of 24. He was in the military, and his loss was heartbreaking for the family. My husband's family no longer celebrates Christmas, it's become a death anniversary, and I can't convey how difficult last year's holidays were. Families are supposed to congregate on that day, yet we're continually reminded that we're all there to grieve my brother-in-law, not to enjoy Christmas. There were no gifts or music, just individuals sitting silently. There were images of my brother-in-law and candles instead of Christmas decorations. We were not permitted to cook. Any food we were given was shared with our neighbors. Instead of Merry Christmas, all I ever hear is, I'm sorry for your loss. My five-year-old daughter and her cousins got to watch Frozen on YouTube because my in-laws TV was turned off all day. They were told to decline. My kid prepared a lovely Christmas card for her grandmother, and I was chastised for not instructing her to make one for her uncle. This may appear selfish, but the kids, particularly my daughter, could not be happy. It was so bad that I offered an alternative way to celebrate this year while still celebrating. They all rejected my offer, and my husband's mother instructed him to manage me. What the hell is going on? I received texts from my in-laws inviting me to their anniversary celebration. I told my spouse that I wanted our kid to be happy and not go through what she went through last year. My kid requested that her father take her out and do something fun with her. He was still covered in his blanket, telling me to get him up at 3 p.m. so we could go see my in-laws. I cooked cookies but was instructed to keep them at home. He stated that he'd buy gifts but not inform anyone and that he'd organize a hidden gift exchange among family members. When we arrived, it was the same scene as the previous year. There will be no food, music, or gifts. Because I was upset, I had to sit for hours while everyone else celebrated Christmas. After my husband disagreed and said, suck it up, we won't be here next year, I left with my daughter. And I took her to a restaurant where we had dinner and other activities. My mother-in-law began calling me to chastise me. When I came home, she and my sister-in-law texted me, calling me insensitive, cruel, heartless, shameless, and so on. I got into a disagreement with my spouse about how I should not have acted so selfishly, pretended that my family's loss was insignificant to me, and left it at that. I should have planned for another day, he added, but I was adamant. 
I battled with him about my daughter being unable to eat at my in-law's house, and he kept making excuses for them, saying I had wrecked his relationship with his family. And there are a couple comments on this one that I'd like to address, so we'll jump right to the comments with this one with Feed the Pug stating, not the moron. It's difficult to lose someone at Christmas. Of course, nothing will ever be the same. But turning the day into a memorial service every year will not bring him back. It simply deprived those who are still alive of their delight. And, after this year, don't we all need that? There are ways to honor him while celebrating Christmas. If your in-laws wish to mourn on that day, they are allowed to do so. They should not impose it on others, especially youngsters. Patterson responds, we're supposed to gather at the house and sit there for hours doing nothing. They all call me selfish, but I felt awful because my daughter wanted to enjoy the holidays like other kids, and I was chastised and called names, and they believe I don't care about their suffering. It hurts, especially since my spouse agreed with them rather than considering his kid. Parker adds, don't be an idiot, your child is very young and deserves to experience the magic of Christmas, especially after this year. If you want her to enjoy the holiday, you are not an idiot. I understand that your family has suffered a devastating and horrible loss, especially given the age of your brother-in-law. So it's difficult to celebrate the holidays, especially if they coincide with an anniversary. It sounds a little too much to me, because the way you describe it sounds like they're keeping it awake. I'm not judging, everyone deals with sorrow differently, but forcing small children not to celebrate Christmas and have a good time is, in my honest view, a bad idea. I hope you understand what I mean, I intend no offense. And Patterson responds to the message. Absolutely, my heart breaks for the other kids, and I wish I could take them to do some fun activities, but their mother-in-law's sister-in-law is against that. I honestly don't understand why the kids should be robbed of joyful times, their kids deserve to enjoy the holiday just like the other kids. This is unfair, and Cranky Kitty says not the idiot. Both of my fatherless parents died on Christmas Eve, five years apart. The following year, we enjoyed a much quieter Christmas Eve and day, but then things returned to normal, or as normal as we could make them. I'd give this family a pass if it were only the adults, but taking away a child's Christmas seems too cruel. I believe you and your husband should have talked things through more and made preparations to spend Christmas at home with your child, limiting the amount of time spent at the in-laws well before the actual day. And, honestly, mine said tough one, but not idiot. There is no justification for ruining a holiday for your daughter, who is well aware of what is going on and that her holiday experience differs greatly from that of others. I understand your in-laws' grief, but the tricky part about emotions is that they are unique to each of us. They are allowed to experience their loss and suffering in the same way that you are allowed to feel yours. They crossed the line when they abused and bullied you for not feeling the same way they do. And the feisty donkey disagrees. It's a terrible loss, but they need to figure out how to grieve without ruining Christmas for the little kids who are present. Your daughter is five years old. I doubt she realizes why she doesn't get Christmas. Before supper, a toast to your brother-in-law or a prayer, if that's their thing, might be appropriate. After my grandfather died, my grandmother usually started Christmas morning with a prayer for him, which only took five minutes of our time, not the entire day. And, according to Collins, including a memorial for the deceased is perfectly fine. Canceling Christmas for everyone, even Santa, seems like an odd way to grieve someone. Consume the deceased brother's favorite foods. Celebrate Christmas by telling stories about him. Stop going there if they don't want to honor him in a way that works for you. Your husband is a complete moron for not understanding or supporting you in any way. When I think about those who have died in my life, like my mother and aunts and so on, I constantly try to put myself in their shoes and imagine what they are thinking right now. Would they want me to be continually sad for them? Would they prefer that I sit quietly with the TV turned off? Or do they want me to have fun? 
absolutely celebrating a remembrance in their honor. That would not be fair to my mother. But I doubt they'd want you to take Christmas away from the kids. And I'm not sure if that comes across as callous, but that's exactly how I feel whenever I recall my family members and begin to cry. And I'm always thinking, how would they want me to feel? Would they want me to just sit there doing nothing and thinking about them? Or would they prefer that I live my life? That is simply something I feel, and it may be an incorrect statement, for which I apologize. But that's just how I feel about these kinds of things. But, in that circumstance, what would you do? It's a really difficult one, an absolutely difficult one, because it's always incredibly difficult to lose a relative, especially on a big day like Christmas. But I don't believe you can take it away from the children. They don't get it. In my opinion, not allowing kids to appreciate Christmas taints their entire lives ahead of them.